Welcome everyone to another week and with that episode 9 of Salmon Report, a weekly series around Splatoon 3 Salmon Run describing the rotations and the weekly weapons to help you succeed in your shifts more. First of all I would like to apologize that episode 9 is one day late but they announced chill season yesterday and there was a lot to do and I'm really excited about it all. But also this week's episode will be special as the last time I mentioned I'd like to try a new format out as I'm not sure I liked how the old videos were structured and so this week's episode will be a brand new experimentation and I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Now let's dive in. The rotations this week are Gunfish and Hydro Plant with the Luna Blaster, Flings a Roller, Splatana Stemper and the Jet Squelcher, Spawning Grounds with Dapple Dooleys, Ballpoint Splatling, Dynamo Roller and the Bamboozler, Sockeye Station with Splatter Shot, Splatana Viper, Blaster, Tentabrella. Then we have our next special event on Hydro Plant again with the Wildcard Weekend with the powerful Grisco Brella. And finally on Spawning Grounds again, the Explosher returns along with the 52 Gale Tetra Duelies and the Jet Squelcher. Overall I would describe it as a fairly challenging week I think, there are a lot of weapons that need practice and knowledge to use them well, but once mastered they are pretty powerful so fear not we have all the resources to help you out. And of course the wildcard weekend with random weapons will be a lot of fun, seeing the Grisco Brella for the first time in Splatoon 3 and seeing if it received any buffs or not. First rotation then on Gunfish and Hydro Plant, there are of course a few things to keep in mind about this stage and its design. I would recommend all of you to start paying attention to using its walls properly, especially considering the weapons of this rotation that benefit from staying at moderate range for which the walls are excellent. The layout helps your flings a roller, but much more your jet squelcher to reach boss salmonids on the shore such as stingers or big shots without trying to leave the middle. And I see so many players reflexively jumping down when they just really don't have to, so practice staying on the walls. The walls are also great for kiting as not only you can jump up and down from them to the middle, but the well known jumping between the gaps can also prove very useful in sticky situations, just make sure you paint the walls so you don't slip off them. Finally considering the walls remember the awesome trick considering reef slider that if fly fishes are near the edge of the wall you can actually slide next to them and the explosion this way will be on the same level with them causing a splat and taking care of a nasty boss without issue. My next advice for the stage would be for its low tide. We have already talked about the importance of luring in a lot of videos but I'd like to stress that luring becomes incredibly important on low tide hydro plant as if you keep rushing to the other side of the bridge, salmonids will get stuck around there with all the eggs and it will be increasingly difficult to collect them. Let them get to this side of the bridge closer to the basket and save yourself a headache. And last but not least remember and practice positioning for glowfly rush waves on the bottom right platform near the basket along with your team to have a better chance of succeeding together. And in panic situations you can always jump on the other side if needed. For the weapons, the Luna Blaster is a powerful but short range blaster and like all the other blasters, excel against stingers, fish sticks and hordes thanks to their area blast attacks. The Luna Blaster is blessed with relatively easier playstyle than the rest of the blasters and its high direct damage allows it to play a lot more aggressively than the rest, making it a pretty good weapon all around for salmon run. Like all blasters I recommend paying attention to painting the walls with them as it's pretty easy and the painted walls are very helpful to the whole team. Just be careful not to get surrounded as its painting power is not the best and since it's short range too it's very hard to escape if you find yourself in salmonid ink all over around yourself. Then the flings of roller is our long range fling centric roller that is still very powerful while rolling and should not be shrugged aside. While for most bosses I recommend its jumping vertical fling for most damage that can even one shot steelheads. Rolls can still be very powerful against chums and small fry especially during glowfly rush wave. Remember to slow roll against hordes by only slightly tilting your controls as this technique will consume 90% less ink than if you were running while still dealing the very same damage. For its weakness it's a slow roller so pick your battles carefully or you will get overwhelmed very fast. The Splatana Stemper is our heavy Splatana added in Splatoon 3, a very unique but incredibly versatile weapon that is useful in all situations I think. Splatanas all deal increased damage in melee range when your swords connect with enemies so you can use that similarly like Brella shields to dish out more damage and the Splatana Stemper's continuous melee charge attacks are one of the highest DPS in Salmon Run, making it one of the primary Kohazuna splatters that should mostly focus on the King Salmonid during extra wave. Don't forget your charge attacks also send a shockwave in a long distance that pierces through targets like a stinger and they are also very formidable weapon for range. Using Splatanas to their full extent is a high risk high reward playstyle as you have to stay close to salmonids to truly bring out their strengths, 
but they also expose you to more danger that way, so I recommend practicing positioning and decision making a lot. Last on this map, the Jet Squelcher, a frequently returning shooter for Salmon Run. It is known for being the longest range shooter that has decent fire rate and damage, and this combination making it really good against all bosses, even on the shores thanks to its range, especially on Gonefish and Hydroplan stage. But sadly it doesn't fire fast enough and its painting power is pretty mediocre. That allows it to get overwhelmed relatively quickly, so it's important to learn kiting and proper positioning with the Jet Squelcher, thus why I recommend staying on the walls and making use of its strengths. Our second shift is on spawning grounds, the dreaded stage with its horrible grades and platforms, so I caution everyone to try and avoid using the grades most of the time, as you cannot paint over them and they're usually a trap that will get you splatted in a terrible position or straight up corner you during high tide. While it has some advantages such as certain bosses like flipper floppers leaving you alone if you're on the grates, it's still very niche use and most likely not worth the risks. There's also a very infamous spawn point at the very end of the grates on the small platform where a flyfish can spawn. This is a very well known trap and in almost all cases you should never fall for it and it's a perfect opportunity to instead use a special to get rid of the flyfish or just learn to live with it and try to cripple one of its launchers with a single splat bomb. As for the Griller and Glowfly Rushwave positioning, Spawning Runs actually has my favorite position on the platform right next to the basket that allows very efficient positioning for both of the nighttime waves, perfect angle to kite Grillers from the left and a very good narrow high ground against Glowfly Rush. The first weapon, the Dapple Duelies, are pretty much the numero one weapon for Salmon Run. That's it. It's just that great. It's also one of the highest DPS overall that you can have, making it a prime candidate for Kohazuna, so during extra wave just focus on Chungus. It is versatile and good in any situation, it all depends on how good you are as a player, and as long as you roll for more dually damage it's pretty much the carry weapon. It also doesn't really have any weaknesses, maybe it's a bit lower range, but it's more than enough as long as you remember to roll for increased fire rate and you'll be fine. It's not the first time we talk about the Bullpoint Splatling, the most versatile Splatling overall and probably the best at the same time. It has two firing modes, a quick burst fire at the beginning of a charge, followed by normal long range firing, but the catch is that you can control this. Since the Bullpoint Splatling can recharge while firing, you can choose whether to burst or fire normally by charging to maximum to always start with a burst, or only recharging partially around halfway to always remain in long range mode. The burst fire mode is also one of the best DPS in Salmon Run, also making this weapon a Kohozuna killer during extra wave. Its weaknesses are mostly that it's a splatling, so if you don't like charging that can be a headache, and it takes some time to learn the double firing mode, but it's so worth it. The Dynamo Roller is one of the most misunderstood weapons in Salmon Run, even though it's probably one of the best weapons for this mode. Contrary to what most people do with the Dynamo Roller, I recommend mostly focusing on roller and not flinging. Your rolls do 400 damage that can roll over even Kohawks, and that makes this weapon the best lesser salmon it clearer pretty much. If you learn to slow roll, you will also counter its weakness of being very ink hungry, and for long range you still have decent flings if needed. Its weakness is pretty much that everyone goes into it with a wrong mindset, thinking it's weak, and if you have no practice with the weapon it can seem very ink hungry that will just put you into more danger. I have a specific dynamo roller guide on my channel that I recommend checking out for more tricks and tips for this weapon. Last the Bamboozler. Boy, this shift is full of technical weapons. This is the hardest charger to play most likely, but it's still very useful and powerful as long as you remember not to play it like a charger. It is your mobile and fast playstyle charger that has incredibly fast charge speed and great fire rate that makes it really efficient to take out even stingers with it. Its strength is around its ability to have control over its damage as depending on your charge you can choose to deal 60 damage or 160 anytime and mastering this is the true challenge of the Bamboozler. This is also its weakness at the same time as it's not just a hard charger but one of the hardest weapons overall. Its full charges also don't pierce through targets like normal, so it's less powerful against lesser salmonids, and its DPS can be low if you haven't mastered the rhythmic firing it requires for its full potential. The third stage will be Sockeye Station, my favorite stage and I think it's the same for most players actually. Its tower in the middle is an excellent location to see the whole map, use it for long range weapons but even for kiting or getting a better position against those nasty steelheads or fish sticks around it. 
My most important tip for Sakai Station is to start practicing luring during no tide waves. Players will often rush to even the other side of the tower when you could just patiently wait around the basket for easier and safer golden eggs for everyone. Remember that the shore is still the most dangerous place to be even if there is a big shot cannon there, as more often than not it's just a trap and you won't be able to collect as many eggs as you think you would and it's better to retreat after splatting big shots and stingers. The Glowfly Wave and also Griller positioning I recommend is right next to the basket as not only is it an excellent location for shooting angle but you can also manipulate which side the wave should arrive from and you are right next to the basket for easy egg collection. This shift's first weapon is the splatter shot, your standard jack of all trades shooter that's decent in any situation really and needs no special explanation as it has no extra strengths or weaknesses and all of you should be fine playing with it. The Spatana Viper is very similar to the Stamper, though it is the faster weapon and allows for a bit more mobility and painting than its brother. Pretty much the same tips apply with more damage in melee range and its charge melee being a very high DPS move, making it a primary Kohazuna splatter for this rotation. Since it's faster, its ranged attacks are even more useful to paint or deal with targets like a fish stick without climbing the tower at all, but remember that Spatanas are a high risk, high reward weapon type because of their melee benefits. The blaster is possibly one of my least favorite weapons to talk about as it's just really an uninteresting weapon I think. It has no specialties like all the other blasters and so it's the usual tip to focus on fish sticks and stingers with them and if you can also get rid of lesser salmonids like chums and small fry that is perfect. Stay near your teammates with this blaster and try to be support with it as it's a relatively dangerous weapon to be alone. Like other blasters, I also recommend painting the wall with them as much as you can, but for its weaknesses, it's pretty middle range with fire rate, damage and painting power, and as I said, its generic middle ground lack of specialization makes it less useful in Salmon Run. Now, the Tent Umbrella is such an interesting weapon, it probably deserves a video of its own that I will make. But in short, it's a very tanky and high survivability weapon that allows for a bunch of neat tricks similarly like the Dynamo Roller. Its shotgun-like slow attacks can be sluggish, but its damage output is quite excellent and with the Umbrella's nature of shooting, it has a really good area attack to deal with lesser salmonids. Its specialty is in fact to deal with hordes as your canopy while open deals damage and shooting it out can hold back a whole Glowfly Rush Horde or any horde really in Salmon Run if used properly. On the other side, it's a hard weapon to learn to use well and because of its slowness and difficulty, most players will struggle with it and it's not recommended to play aggressively unless you know what you're doing. Moving on, the maps are repeating so I will skip the map tips as the same ones apply from before. The fourth rotation of the week is the special wildcard weekend that is known for its random weapon rotation, where every player gets a random weapon each wave with a chance of gaining this weekend's special Grisco weapon which is the Grisco Brella this time around. In fact, you have 20% chance of getting Grisco weapon each time, so it's relatively high. The Grisco Brella is a very unique, but sadly one of the weaker Grisco weapons to exist. It's one of the fastest Brellas though, with a fire rate of a 96 gal that deals around 60 damage per hit in Splatoon 2, and we'll see how it is here. Just like other Brellas, it's great against stingers and hordes, but its fast fire rate and good damage basically converts this weapon into an average shooter. Its weakness is that like most Grisco weapons, it's very ink hungry and for whatever reason, the Grisco Brella does not have a canopy shield, so in essence, it's just a standard shooter. Sadly, it is considered one of the weakest Grisco weapons, but its ease of use, similarly like the Grisco Blaster, makes it a fun weapon to play with, so I still very much recommend trying out this wildcard weekend. The last rotation of the week will be held once again on spawning grounds. The 52 Gal is a powerful, I would say, mid-range shooter with mediocre fire rate but good damage that can deal with bosses easily, and I would primarily say it's a boss killing weapon. But its lack of painting and slow fire rate leaves it flat open against lesser salmonids and hordes so it has to position itself right, but can still be played aggressively and mobile as long as you avoid getting cornered. The Dark Tetra Duelies are one of the weaker duelies in the game but still quite powerful. Their specialty is around the ability to roll 4 times in a row, which while being quite useful in PvP, it isn't the best thing to have in Salmon Run. Like most duelies, you should roll to increase your fire rate and maximize your damage, but with the Tetra Duelies I especially recommend to use your ability to roll 4 times as you can roll through Salmon and Ink without getting slowed down, which makes it a great weapon to get in and out really fast in dangerous situations like the shore. For its weakness, it's mainly its inaccuracy and range along with being one of the weaker duelies damage-wise, so they aren't great against Kohozuna. 
then the Explosher, the favorite weapon of many, is back. The Explosher is very famous for being the weapon that can split fly fishes as their shots act like split bombs and by shooting into their launchers you can destroy them and this also works by the way for mudmouth waves. Next to this great ability it has excellent range to deal with stingers or anything else on the shore and its explosive shots deal with lesser hordes very well if aimed properly. Since it has blasting shots similarly like blasters it paints walls perfectly. For its weaknesses, it's very slow and sluggish weapon that isn't really that great overall once you know how to deal with fly fishes normally. So I would say the better salmon run player you are, the less useful the explosher becomes. Lastly, it's the jet squelcher again from rotation 1. So I'll repeat the important parts that it is the longest range shooter with average fire rate and damage and I mostly recommend keeping at range with it where it excels the most and try to avoid close range encounters as it can get easily overwhelmed. Its specialty is definitely dealing with stingers, steelheads like most long range guns, so try to play it almost like a charger. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's special salmon report everyone. I'd like to interview you on how you liked this episode, if this format and presentation was something you liked more or not, as I wasn't sure I was happy with how it was before. But this format might help a lot with creating these episodes every Monday. Leave your feedback as I'm interested in all of it, whether it's positive or negative, and you know the drill. If you have any tips or questions, make sure to leave them in the comments section like always. Thank you so much for supporting my content and Salmon Report, and I hope these tips will be useful for the week to come. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all the next time.